Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And today we're going to look at the ad zine. The ad zine is uh, one of the more DIY projects I've done in my life. This was done in conjunction with uh, fellow cartoonist Jason Lex. And it's basically about production. One of my favorite things is just literally making things. Yeah. And so this came about from a few influences, and it's going to be, I think, hopefully fun for the kayfabers at home because you're going to see some comics art by guys like Charles Burns and Todd McFarlane, Jack Davis, Jack Kirby, that you may not think of or may not have even seen before uh, because of the nature of it. And so this is all found comic book ads. The reason this exists is because I wanted to test what I could do with my stupid inkjet printer, the same inkjet printer that everybody has at home that you can get for, you know, $69 or something at Office Max. What inspired you to uh, play around with that printer, Jim? Glad you asked. So I order stuff, mail order and things, and uh, somebody turned me on to Jason Carnes, who... Shouts to Carnes, man. He's an outlaw uh, kayfaber. By, yes, clearly he's an outlaw cartoonist. And I think Ben Mara or somebody recommended him to me. I found his stuff online and I ordered it. And whenever it showed up, it was these mini comics. Girls get really grossed up by that green putrid jism. So, so, do, so does this boy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I ordered a couple of these. They come in the mail. They're these mini comics, nice glossy cover. And then you open them up and they're this like newsprint color. This was probably, I don't know, eight or ten years ago that I got hold of this. And I'm like, okay, how are you making this? Because I make mini comics. I make zines. I, I, you know, work in print and color and all this different stuff. And I love this aesthetic, which is like old comics. It's that faded out newsprint color that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. I'm often complaining about reprints and they're on glossy paper and coated paper and it doesn't look the same. Whenever I got this, I instantly had to know more. So I reached out to Jason Carnes to hear, like, how are you printing this? How are you making these, like, faded newsprint comics that I didn't think were possible to make? And he told me he was just printing them out on his inkjet printer. I have an inkjet printer. Everybody has an inkjet printer. You know, you can probably get them for a lot less than $69. And what do you use it for? Like, like the, the color cartridges, you know what I mean? Like, it's, 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 your, it's your mom, it's your grandma who are printing out family photos on that bullshit. That's the thing. Probably everybody who's watching this, it's like, I have one of those printers. Your inkjets are probably clogged because you don't use it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it made me start thinking, though, and investigating and experimenting. You know, there are settings whenever you print stuff where you can adjust, like, how much ink you want to come out. So you can just lower those levels if you want it to be a little bit more faded or whatever. And also, you're feeding single sheets of paper through, which means you can print on newsprint. You know, certain machines, you can't print on newsprint. It's too thin. It doesn't really grab. But if it's an inkjet, you're just feeding the pages in. So you can print on almost any kind of paper with that. And uh, this stuff really got sent me down a rabbit hole of, like, all right, now I need a project. I need something to experiment with. We should we should do a full fuck a tour. Oh yeah, we should episode at some point. But the task at hand, the ad zine. Yeah. So the other thing I was looking at at the time is I was buying. I started buying comic books, like old back issues. You know, like everybody was dumping back issues about ten years ago to save space, and because trades and digital, they just weren't worth as much. So I'm buying up lots of these old back issues for quarters, fifty cents, dollars, and I'm seeing all these great ads and thinking like they're just gone. I love that stuff, and it does not exist whenever people put together trade paperbacks. And so I start putting together a collection of these things, along with Jason Lexus, who I'm dive, you know, back issue bin diving. And so this is a collection of some of my favorite comic book ads, and it's printed on four different types of paper stock. It it reprints ads from the 1940s to basically the 2000s, and I tried to approximate different paper to match those ads. And then I also went through and I would read comics and I would make notes of like what pages ads fell on. So the cover was virtually never an ad. There are a few exceptions like the superhero catalogs that Joe Kubert did. Uh, but for the most part, ads aren't on the cover. Some comics do have ads on the first page. Yeah, like Harvey Comics. <laughs> yes. So the big ones would often be like page three would often be an ad. Um, and it, you know, it varies, but I would do a count of like how many ads there were. And the way I would break this up is there are two types of contents in this ad zine one is full pages and that's what i count as an ad the other one are ads that have comics mm -hmm. and so that's counted as a comics page when i was doing my uh, my bar graphs of how comics are broken up into pages of comics versus pages of ads and so that's what's reflected in here and then it was a matter of going through about 2,000 ads to kind of like figure out which ones i wanted to put in the first thing you notice is that the cover's ripped off which is very common because 
most comics don't have ads on the cover. I ripped the, we ripped the cover off once it was made. So you can see the remnants of that and you can see the back cover is still intact and it's still that glossy cover stock. And then we wanted an ad that looked like something like a title. So this is, uh, you know, Duke the Super Action Dog is basically our cover, even though it's technically page one. Inside cover is almost always an ad. So this gets that full page treatment. And in this case, it's Jack Davis. Yeah, classic ad. Jack Davis, you'll see a lot of comic book ads by Jack Davis. Yeah, I like that uh, That one. Uh, he did like a vampire thing, vampire bubble gum. Yes. Is that in here? I don't know if that's in here or not. It definitely it definitely makes the cut. And it's been a few years since I did this. Um, but it was all printed. You know, like I printed these all by hand each page. And I did an edition of 40 plus a couple of uh, like artist proofs. It was very hard to print. I ended up using all refurbished ink cartridges. I started with brand new ink cartridges, printed out two complete issues, and that was it. And the ink cartridges were like, I don't know, 40 bucks or maybe 80 bucks for like two of them or something. I ordered all refurbished ink cartridges, which came out to about 90% less cost. Yeah. And because I had used the regular ink cartridges, I could compare them, exactly the same results. Mm-hmm. Same number of pages printed, same color. So the refurb stuff is good, yeah. Yeah. So then, you know, like it just gets into like what... What is interesting? What ads do we find fun? Um, I th- it's so funny just because knowing you guys, like, I, I think I could tell who chose what ads and shit <laughs> by just looking at these things. Like, this is definitely a Jason ad, if I had to guess. That's funny. That's the don't, your bullet headed character type. Yeah. Very popular. And you see the same kind and, of. And that would be a Jim Rugg ad, right? This here. is a Jim Rugg ad. Yeah, for sure. And by the way, Jack Kirby art. Yep. Big Jim's pack. This is probably a Jim Rugg ad, too, because how do you not do a Jack Kirby with Big Jim's characters for action <laughs> figures? But a lot of these ads would be done in house. You know, these comic book publishers would sell ad space, and then it would be like, well, create the ad for us. I didn't know that. And so that's what you'd have bullpens and stuff. It would just be whoever was around or low man on a totem pole or whoever had an hour. And so that's why you get a lot of these ads are done by professionals that you just don't, you never see that work. It's not reprinted. It's not collected. It's just lost. It's so messed up too, because the money that is paid for those ads is probably like so much more than like your average comic, but I bet you they got paid jobber rates. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm sure paid almost nothing. Um, Ellen Fournay, it's interesting. The number of cartoonists that do some kind of ad at some point. Yeah. And what's, uh, what's that advertising? This is probably a little bit of a, uh, this might even be a Lampoon ad, actually. I'm not sure if this is for a real ad. It might be for a movie. This might be from the Roger Corman comics. Again, it's been almost 10 years since I put this together, and I don't remember all the sources, but this may have appeared, Roger Corman did, I don't know, 10 issues of comics in the early 90s. This may have been an ad for a movie, one of his movies. Some of them are just things that we find interesting, right? Like the oven bake, the easy bake oven ads. Which is real funny because, like, the idea of giving kids something that could start fires today. I burnt myself on that fucking light bulb with my little cousin. <laughs> a lot of these old, old ads. You're going to see a lot of so, ads that are inappropriate. So, so girls had this. Yes. And, and boys had the creepy crawlers. The creepy crawlers, it was a fucking iron template that you heat up and put molten fucking plastic in. Yes. Like, all of my uncles are disfigured. <laughs> A little bit because of the 1960s creepy crawlers. Yes. Like, hardcore back in the day. Did you ever eat any of this stuff? I ate this stuff. And it was garbage. It was so bad. And as a kid, it was the greatest thing ever. It was like baby food or something. <laughs> like, it's like, well, this is supposed to be bread, but why does it turn to liquid yeah, so yeah. quick? Not, not, not good. <laughs> I'm sure we shouldn't be eating that. So how about this for a spread? On the left, we have Todd McFarlane doing a corn ad. On the right, Charles Burns doing these Altoid strips. Yeah, he did so many of those Altoid strips, and they would be in big proper yeah. magazines. Now, like what I was saying about the the like the job or Marvel comic ads, uh, probably paid nothing. An ad like this could be a $10,000 account. Yeah, this Altoids was not going to the Marvel bullpen. They were showing up with the art that they wanted to run. Exactly, and it, and it was in like real magazines. Like, I don't know where you source this, man, but uh, I have magaz- I have like Entertainment Weeklies with Altoid uh, Charles Burns ads. Um, All of these came Rolling from Stone. comics. I think this came from Marvel, early 2000s, is when I believe where I found this one. So imagine this in the middle of a Marvel comic where you're looking at, I don't know, Brian Hitch or whoever. You know, whoever's drawn the Marvel, Ed McGuinness or something, and then you turn the page and Charles Burns comic in the middle of it. Pretty cool. Yeah. Even the color is kind of sick. Like, I imagine that he picked that, too, because it's so specific. But the McFarlane stuff, like, when do you see that at? You know, when do you see that art if you're a McFarlane fan? Right. Uh, Neil Adams? 
Can't miss it, man, with that fucking abuse of that uh, airbrush. Con- continuity colors. Continuity colors. <laughs> uh, early video games. Lex may have picked this one, but I love like the early video game depictions of stuff. I'm a huge fan, and and we could probably like if we, you know, we have this channel for a couple years, man, and we exa- we exhaust all ideas. One one idea that we could go to is the drawn eight bit graphic because I could think of about three or four places. Uh, Mark Silvestri has an X Men issue where there's like a computer, there's like a camera that's that's uh, that pix- stuff's always funny. Some characters. And uh, it's awesome because it's like you could tell that they drew it like on a piece of graph paper probably because the square. If, yeah. if you fuck up the square, you fuck up the whole thing. So it's like they have to get it pretty right and they always do all, all the examples i have in my mind they always they all get it right you know what's funny it's the same principles as doing perspective it's just it's just 2d it's like all perpendicular right but it's the same deal like you would just do your underlying grid or whatever to uh or make sure everything paper, lines man. up that, that blue line is uh, non-photo and by the way ed we could do that episode next week as far as i'm concerned <laughs> there's a marvel two in one where the thing goes to like a pac-man world. yes that would be a part of that group yes some of them are funny, too, in terms of who's reading these comics, who is our target audience. Yeah. Because there are some weird ads that we would come across, of, like mean, getting your GED and your kids being ashamed of you and stuff. You look at this and it's <laughs> this like, okay, amazing. that's Charlton. <laughs> also, this feels like a toy I had when I was a kid that had like metal shavings that you would move around with a magnet oh, to like right, draw yeah, on yeah. a face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally, because it would always be like, draw, the mu- you know, draw a mustache. You know what? It's so funny. I haven't thought about those things ever, or like in a million years, and I got them... Two times. One, when I was in the waiting room when my brother was being born, and two, when my sister was being born. It's like at the at the baby hospital waiting room. Like that, That's where you buy those things. And some are just snapshots, you know, customizing your van decals. These are just snapshots of that time period. Yeah. And part of it is variety. You know, like I wanted half-page ads. I wanted to kind of represent what you would see and, you know, put them through these old comics. This is some of those like, uh, hey, you're a loser. You need to get your shit together. Kind of hey, hey, comic reader, man! Like uh, maybe, maybe you need to step up and uh, put on your big boy britches. Carpet cleaning is one of the early businesses. There's a lot of entrepreneurial stuff, and also like uh, um, correspondence courses. You know, for everything from like electrician to being a cartoonist. I always wonder about, and it, there's no way it could be in here because it was a is a photographic ad. But uh, the whole grit thing, uh, you know, sell grit like. That had to be a fucking pyramid scheme. Those were in every every comic book, man. Yeah. There were so many of those. Um, this is your, like, Saturday morning... You had to get one of these in there. Yeah, these were big. And, and, and this and is how we can be... tell you guys are old, old fuckers, man, because, like, it's all cartoons I don't even know about. You know what, though? They ran for years, and they would often be the two-page spread. There might even be one in here. You know, like, it would be the big thing in the fall. You'd see, like, yeah. a couple of months' worth that would really be advertising. That, but the... you guys chose, like, the most obscure one I've Pete ever Duncan seen. Pete Duncan Dropout? <laughs> Again, a lot of, like, losers reading comics. Like, all these ads are targeted at people that need help. Uh, Fumetti. You know, like, everything's represented. Every kind of comic you can imagine you can find in these pages of, uh, of the ads in these comics. And then also, the gun ads. The gun ads are always the ones that are, like, there are a lot of BB guns and replica guns and all kinds of various gun things being sold. Laser tag. Did you have laser tag when you were little? I did not. I did. I did not, but I saw two na- two neighborhood kids running around shooting each other with some like twentieth generation laser tag that was beeping. There's the bazookas. Other, this week. <laughs> you ever see the bazooka? No. Yeah, it, it has a big area of effect, man. So if you just point it in the direction of somebody with that little sensor, man, you'll get them. Okay, so notice the different paper stock, right? Yeah. There are four paper stocks. One of these newsprints. Whenever I put this together, I went to a bookmaker I know, and I was like talking about. I showed them the PDF, and I was just kind of asking for any kind of feedback suggestions thoughts they had on it and they told me about this newsprint that you uh that you haul sells as wrapping paper so if you're wrapping up glasses or something and they sell it in this like it's in sheets but it's sort of like this flopped over like a a roll it's almost like a fabric you know like a thing of fabric that you would buy a bolt of fabric and so that's some of the newsprint there's a couple different kinds of newsprint some is from like pads of newsprint um, but it was one of the pieces that was very kind of instrumental in getting that like soft, thin newsprint of old comic books. There it is, man. Cinema sewer. Yes, exactly. Very, very much. This feels like an iconic ad to me, but I did do a, one of my favorite drawings Jim, based on this ad. Put that image up on screen I right will. now. <laughs> Astronaut tough. There's a whole genre of these ads for weightlifting, gaining muscle. Karate has its own. You could do thousands of ads on karate. 
the creepiest ad of all time and one of one of the most current for this book. This it, is probably the early 2000s. Yeah, I, n- I never seen what that before. What is that? <laughs> it, it's so disturbing. Like, what is that? Yeah, I have no idea what the Who did this been. ad? I think it's online. It's an online comics order place. It's funny that none of these early uh, dot com comics companies like stuck. You'd think that would have made sense what? and been the future, but like they, they, none of them held on. Does he got blood on his ass? It's a torn. It's like this torn. Oh. I don't know if those are his tidy whities or if they're if that's his costume. I have no idea. But who put this together and went? That's perfect. Right. Ten minutes later, they got a business. <laughs> More video games. Lane Mastodon. Just the dumbest, like, if you're in the video game era, this should not be your advertising mascot. Captain Tootsie. Captain Tootsie is a character that Eric Larson has brought into Savage Dragon. This is C.C. Beck. This is probably the oldest ad in here, and this is from the late 30s, early 40s. And he calls, like, one of the characters Fatso. You can't, you can't get away with that now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was there was all crazy shit back, back then, man. Yeah. But I think this is a, a, a supporting character now in Savage Dragon, like a regular supporting character. Ah, uh, Captain Tootsie, man. They, they didn't uh, re-up their uh, copyright and trademark. Whenever whenever DC settled the whole uh, Captain Marvel stuff, nobody wanted Captain Tootsie. <laughs> <laughs> Just dr- drifted into the public domain. Such a shitty candy. The creepy advertising mascots of Mr. Bubble, like, hey, kids, let's, <laughs> let's take a bath. Just popping up in nude children's bathtubs. Yeah, really inappropriate and totally looks like the chocolate syrup that you would pour into your uh, into your milk. That is true. It's the exact same bottle. <laughs> and then, you know, like some of this stuff is creating narratives, right? So the reason we would have picked this ad is because we wanted this ad. Are your children ashamed that you never finished high school? Whose mom is reading these comics and being like, okay, I got I to gotta earn my children's respect? Okay. <laughs> Pretty strange. But it's almost the exact same archetype that you see, you know, like the mom in these comics. So some of it is like juxtaposing like what makes a good spread. Just weird kind of comics, but really stretching it where you do have sequences. But this is a a far cry from the more traditional comics as we think of comics. So again, showing kind of like formal innovation, but still comics in the ads. OJ Simpson. Classic. Selling cowboy boots. Classic. Why would it make sense for O.J. Simpson to sell cowboy boots? He was on everything, man. Hertz Rental Cars at this time? He was on everything. This is not the only O.J. Simpson endorsed product that you can find in comic book ads. We we chose one, but we had several. Yeah. One of the fun things of putting this together was working with somebody in in design and having, like, uh, all of the ads, like, around. You know, like, we went from, I don't know, a couple hundred pages down to what you see here, like, 32 pages but it was very fun actually doing that collaboration. And if you work digitally, I encourage you to collaborate with somebody digitally in person once this uh, quarantine's over, because it's weird to see other people doing the same tasks. Like it's, we all get to the same point in Photoshop or InDesign or whatever software, but nobody gets there the same way right. twice. And it's so weird watching somebody else do it. And then this is from Real Deal, Power Bear ad. Uh, Real Deal, one of the uh, underground outlaw comics that we need to look at at some point. Yeah. And... It's very much like an exploitation type comic. And one of the ads was for like Indian exploitation, which would be like Billy Jack. Right, yeah. And, and, you know, kind of a small movement. But it was part of that, you know, it was in that 70s era when films were kind of making those types of movies. And this always reminded me of like that type of, uh, I don't know, that little bit of film genre history. As far as I know, Power Bear never existed, but I always loved this ad. Is uh, Is that by our guy? I think so. It looks like it to me. I always forget his fake name. Yeah, I do too. We it's, need to look at those comics. Ar- Arbone, Arbone is the writer and uh, Raw Dog. Raw Dog. <laughs> Raw Dog. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to take a closer look, but I always loved that ad and it felt like an inside back cover ad was a perfect place to put it's this. amazing. Because like, he might, be, I mean, we could get a conversation with him going pretty easy, but I look at this and... Like Gary Panther comes to mind. Totally. But I don't think he... I think he arrived at this place on his own. Part of Gary Panther's... What makes him brilliant is his drawing style is this intuitive thing. Like, you could look at a lot of people's... I don't know. Not childhood drawings exactly, but it's a very, like, primal way of drawing. And so, like, you'll see other artists that will draw that way to some degree. And I don't think it's because they're looking at Gary Panther. I think it's a very intuitive approach to, like, mark making and drawing. And I think that's probably what you have here. I think you see it in the Fort Thunder guys. 
And then the back cover, one of my all time favorite ads, just because like this is from 1967. This is the height of Vietnam. And it's like, hey, kids, get your own replica M16. Again, never in a zillion trillion years could you run this ad on the back of anything aimed at children today. Definitely not, man. That would just be, uh, you know, we don't want to encourage more more kids getting uh, fucking guns in their hand and shit, man. But I had, uh, I had a, uh, it was like a military green version of this in like nineteen, you know, eighty three, eighty four. Oh yeah, I we had, had, had the same sound. Like 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 the harder you pull the trigger, the more of that sound you get. Yes. Like I don't know what the mechanism is on the inside, but I had one of those things. That is the dumbest gimmick that that sound making thing. Like it's such a useless thing, but those guns had it and you needed it. I had all those replica guns, AK 47s and I had stuff. An Uzi. Yeah. I had an Uzi with the silencer, like the Mac 10 version. <laughs> Not me. So you were a bigger <laughs> kid, but you got the cooler one. But you know what the craziest shit was, was, um, the cap guns with the roll. Like I had, a. Uh, a RoboCop toy, and then you like load his chest with with the rule caps with yeah. the little circles, and it would pop like on the back. So you would pull it back, and, and it would and it would snap like kind of like the the firing pin, the the hammer, and the sparks would hit your hand. Like, yeah, you would burn yourself every time <laughs> you fucking use it. Every time you're hurting yourself, <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> it's so weird. Nobody man. was suing over that back then. <laughs> We would always take those round ones and just hit them with a hammer on totally. the sidewalk. Or just scratch it with your finger even, and it would do the trick. The last detail, and I'm going to show it on screen. I don't have it on here. You can see this is a, a just an artist proof. So, like, I, I would experiment, in, you know, making these. But the last detail was I made si- I made each one a numbered edition of, like, 40, and I did a price tag. And so the price tag had 40 in the slash, and then you would fill in, the you know, the number. And I was so proud of that. And it was like the last piece. And I wasn't sure how to number and sign all these. So I went for a run and I thought of it while I was running. So I'm going to show that one on screen. I didn't realize this wasn't uh, wasn't a numbered issue. Yeah, I don't have my, I don't have mine hand, handy. Maybe you even gave me an artist proof because I don't remember the tag. But this is a lot of like my favorite thing is making the whole, you know, the whole package. And so like this was one of those early experiments. And whenever I started doing a lot more like print on demand where I was putting together books and zines in the in the decades since then, you'll see this kind of like matching up different paper stocks and things, you know, to, to put together a book that even though it's handmade or it's print on demand, it has that unique qualities and it has the care and sort of like a certain amount of creative freedom that goes into being able to build these things yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, or after looking at the demographic data, gentlemen and gentlemen, (laughs) uh, on Cartoonist Kayfabe channel, we use every piece of the buffalo, and that includes the ads, man. We dig it all. It is a lost piece of of comics history in my mind, so I'm happy to show some of those off. And whenever you are back issue digging, man, don't just gloss over those pages. You'd be surprised the artists that have uh, done ads in the history of comics. Yeah. yeah, Almost everybody. I think think it was uh, Joe Orlando is the guy who created the the look of sea monkeys in those ads. Like, when you see yeah. those those cartoon sea monkeys, like, that's that's Joe Orlando. Russ Heath did, did uh, a lot of this ad work. Yeah, he would do those play sets that were, like, the soldier play sets 1, and stuff. 1,000 character play sets. I ordered one of those once, and it was not... Man, is that thing a piece of trash. Hey, Fabers, check out Mail Order Mysteries, <laughs> uh, where the guy ordered, like, everything that was in an ad in an old comic and shows it off. You know, he got the stuff off of eBay, shows it off, writes about it, sometimes finds a creator or two of, of these uh, scams. Some of the stuff is straight, straight up <laughs> scams. There's the great... Uh, Paul Pope has a story in his solo issue at DC, and it's about, like, he sent away for that, like, seven-foot ghost or whatever oh, yeah. that you see advertised. And, of course, they all end in the same way. Like, you get hold of the thing, and it's just, this is the most disappointing piece of garbage of all time. Uh, two funny stories to wrap this up. I have heard from somebody who picked this up at the Joe Cock Warehouse in Brooklyn, which is one of those big comics dealers, and just found it in, like, their dollar box, thinking this was just an old... You know, piece of crap comic, which makes me want to do bootlegs of old comics. You probably know who who you you know you you know who must have got rid of it, man. So you should you should call them out by name here. I should be able to track them down, but I don't know that Ed. I, I keep no good records of that kind of stuff. The other one is Jason Hamlin, Dealer of the Stars, sold one of these same deal, didn't know what it was, and eventually tracked one down years later. Whenever he uh, whenever we got to know each other, and he realized what this thing was. So. How many of these exist? Forty. 40 and I've got like two of them at home. So not very many, you know, I mean, it is, it is not feasible to do a lot of a big edition whenever you're hand printing every single page. Yeah. Took about a week to print this thing out. Fuck. 
But I'm happy to do it, and I'm happy to learn the newsprint thing because I have done things where I print a piece like this and then scan it to get that, like, right. aged look. Right. Um, so lots to learn, very fun, and uh, it all comes back to Jason Carnes, man. Like, he is literally the reason that I started experimenting with this kind of production. So we will look closer at, at his work at some point in the near future. Sounds good, man. We should wrap this up. You ready to get out yes. of here? Okay, favors, like, subscribe, follow the YouTube channel, hit the bell icon. We'll notify you whenever we have new videos available. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the link below this video. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe merchandise and t-shirts at the links below this video. Jimmy, we got to bounce, dude. Give them the marching orders. Make more comics. <laughs>